and what did we understand, what did we understand by the term sepsis the time we had it i'll just i don't want to pick randomly yet so just unmute yourself and and tell me what you what you understood by the word sepsis if you've had it before I don't want to pick on names, so I'm interested. So I'm interested. I, morning, doctor. I understand morning. sepsis morning. as a condition associated with, with the malt organ dysfunction resulting from mm -hmm. immune dysregulation in response to infection. Good. So break it down for, break. A, for a five year old or a P5. If I have child. What did you understand by that statement that you said? It's very correct. So what did you understand by that statement? After the network is breaking. I don't hear you well, but what I understand is that with the sepsis, there is generalized multi organ dysfunction. So this brings down temperature, it brings down metabolic rate, it, it brings down respiration, meaning systems that sustain life all decline, all, yeah, all go down in, in favor of sepsis, or all go down and fail to sustain life of an individual who has sepsis. Okay, good. I think for a P5 kid, child, you just tell them sepsis is uh, when the body overreacts that it tries to harm itself. Okay, overreacts to? Uh, can overreact to disease or germs or okay. any change. Not any change, it's usually infection. Okay. So well okay. said. Um, yes. So <clears throat> looking at this paper, they were looking at the um, it's it's from it's a it's from the Lancet Journal that was looking at um, sepsis, its incidence and mortality from 1992 to 2017. And if you look at this, 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 is, this is one of the images from the article. And you look at this area. So the part, the, the map above shows you the, the incidence, and then this looks at mortality. So if you look at Sub-Saharan Africa, those are, and then a bit of parts of Asia, but I wanted to concentrate on Africa um, or Sub-Saharan Africa. You see a lot of our cases are usually in two, around 2,500 to about 4,000 cases per 100,000. And those are the ones that are usually diagnosed. And remember, we have a challenge with underreporting um, in Africa. So that shows how much burden of sepsis we have. That's the reason why you're having this lecture at certain an uncomfortable time. It's it has a high incidence, though underreported. And when we go down to mortality, it's even worse. Um, you still see sub-Saharan Africa, much as much as it looks like um, Uganda is a bit safe, but we still have a, a mortality of 45, around 45% which is quite high compared to um, all the other countries. Okay. So basically what we're going to, the, the, the flow of this discussion, we'll be looking at its definition, trying to understand its pathophysiology, um, how manage, how it, could be managed, um, but we'll talk about the bundles. And then just highlight something on the multisystemic um, inflammatory syndrome that we see 
in COVID-19 and a lot of the pediatric presentations with COVID-19 were actually coming in with, with, with something like that. So COVID-19 sort of gives you something like sepsis. So the current definitions that I used are sepsis itself is it's, it's organ dysfunction because you have a dysregulated <clears throat> immune response to infection. So normally, if you have infection from any pathogen, be it a protozoan, be it some, a fungus, be it a virus, be it a bacterial um, infection, you're going to have a normal response to try and counteract this. You're going to have all these um, leukocytes come in and produce all these cytokines so that you try and fight, so that it tries and fights this infection. So what happens is with this um, sepsis, it's not the regulated normal that we see. You have an increased or it's hyper compared to the other, or it's much less than it's supposed to be. And so you end up with organ dysfunction because of those effects, okay? So what we call septic shock, um, most ends will want to, to define it by what by how we diagnose it, but it's actually a bit of sepsis where you have significant abnormalities in your circulation and metabolism at cellular level uh, because of this because of what sepsis has caused. And when you have a patient in septic shock, you they have a significantly increased likelihood of dying, hence the increase in mortality. Okay, so ignoring the, the definition that's up, the, so what you usually define as septic shock is you have sepsis and then the, the patient has significant hemodynamic instability. So they'll need vasopressors to maintain them up above 65 and lactate. How this, I'm sorry, and lactate above two millimoles a liter despite adequate fluid resuscitation. Um, I will pick on someone called agrarian. What do you understand by adequate fluid resuscitation? Okay, has failed to unmute just as Kindly unmute and tell us what you understand by adequate fluid resuscitation. Uh, good morning, everyone. I could define adequate fluid resuscitation as any amount of fluid given to restore the hemodynamic instability and, and the changes are stable with subsequent with monitoring. But now we are saying that the patient is not responding. So how does stable come in? What did you come across when you were looking at resuscitation in septic patients? Uh, <clears throat> In sepsis patient, I think we should mm -hmm. give some other medications to make them respond after even suspicion. So before we give, so when do we realize that we now need to add medication? Mercy. Someone called Covacin, Jen Mercy. Uh, doctor, good morning. Adequate uh, fluid resuscitation, I believe, is when you have uh, given your maintenance fluids for a sufficient time and you see uh, in sepsis when you see no change, probably after maybe two to three liters of balanced crystal. Shall okay, tell about that. Um, did you ever come across a patient whom we think were septic? No, not, not really. 
and that year yes and the award yes you didn't come across you've never come across any patients whom you thought were septic no i have not you've not yes okay so that's not the definition of adequate fluid resuscitation Adequate fluid resuscitation, when they're looking at sepsis mainly for adults, they look at 30 mils per kilogram. Per kilogram body weight, if you're giving a patient that, then you would say that they are septic. So this is just a schematic diagram that sort of summarizes what Okay, I see someone in the chat saying you had no clue of what on what what was done. You'll probably unmute later and explain what your statement means. So this is really just summarizing what happens or sort of summarizing the definitions above. So you have an infection from any source. It could be catheter related, it could be The person who put 20 mils per kg is, is, is usually used in the pediatric patients. For sepsis, they do 30 mils per kilogram body weight <clears throat> for older people, for older patients, then 20 is your pediatric patient. So you have a source of infection, be it airway, be it a catheter, um, a urethral catheter, it would be a, can, a peripheral IV. Cannula, it would be a central venous catheter, any of those ports of entry. And then you have bacteria or pathogen entering blood. And then you have the effects and then there's leaking of the blood vessels because of the details that we're going to see much um, in the next slide. Shinto, you've raised your hand. What is it? Yes, um, after how long do we say that the, the fluid resuscitation has failed? So usually giving them boluses or 30 mils per kg, that's what they would term as adequate fluid resuscitation. However, there are things, hemodynamics that you're monitoring to see whether your patient is actually responding to fluid or they've had significant damage. So. So there are dynamic parameters that um, we usually use that maybe I'll just mention, though they are beyond the scope of, of, of this, this particular lecture, but things like what you call a passive leg raise, those are dynamic parameters that you find. Things that we do that um, you do like stroke, you, so you like stroke volume, pulse pressure variation, those are, those are things that are used to monitor whether your patient is actually responding to fluid. Then commonly we look at their hemodynamics, their pulse rate, their blood pressure, you're looking at the warmth of their peripheries. Those are all things that you're looking at to see whether you are perfusing or improving perfusion, okay? I don't know if that, does that answer your question a bit? Yes, it does. So you look at all those parameters to see whether you're in output to see whether you're actually helping these kidneys improve. And then some of the tests that are done, like your arterial blood gases, which will show you lactate, are bedside tests that come out in minutes. So if you're in a facility that you do that and use it to monitor. Um, your changes or your response. Uh, someone in the chat says, I do not, I think we don't use lactate. So you're having, so that definition is really your map is greater than 65. You need vasopressors to maintain that map, or you have a lactate that's a greater than that, than, than two millimoles, despite you giving this patient adequate fluid. 
So you want the lactate low, but despite flu adequate resuscitation, you still have a lactate that is above two millimeters, sorry, two millimoles per liter. So back to this, this slide. So it's, this just simply summarizes um, the, what really happens and then ends up in mortality. This is just looking at the different sources of infection or sources of roots of infection or where the pathogens could come in. Okay, so getting down to the pathophysiology. So what usually happens, whatever pathogen it is, will enter um, either community acquired or it's a hospital acquired infection. And then you have the it getting into the host and then you have an innate response or a compensatory, an innate response where you have the leukocytes coming in, all the macrophages, and then leading to production of the inflammatory proteins that we see, the pro-inflammatory proteins. And then you have a compensatory response, like the fever that we see, that's going to show you that there is a sign of infection. However, that's, that's going to be what the normal host response is going to be. However, other factors that are going to determine what kind of response this host is going to have, which gives us a dysregulated host response. Yes, Joseph, the lower part of the screen is dark intentionally. Kindly concentrate on what's happening. Okay, so you respond. So comorbidities will probably lead to a decreased um, immune response, meaning you have more of your bacteria or more, sorry, more of your pathogen. Um, your pathogen is going to be able to travel to all the different organs much, much easily without meeting any um, barriers. Then the virulence of the pathogen, if you have something like wave, you're going to have less, you're going to have um, a worse systemic response compared to, with a Delta variant compared to, to something else. And then the vulnerability of at the infection site. So if it's easily, if you have a lot of blood flow in that area, then you're going to have it travel much easily and therefore it's going to spread. So if something is in a joint, if it doesn't easy, say if you have something that's in a joint compared to getting a, a bloodstream, a catheter related bloodstream infection, catheter meaning a central venous catheter, so if you had someone with a, with a central venous catheter getting sepsis, comparing it to someone who is getting it from a joint infection, the one who has a central venous catheter will, get a, will, 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 will have a more, more systemic infection, a more, a more, say a higher level of the pathogens in their blood, which will lead you to a worse response and genetics for some will play a role. So if you have patients who already have um, deficiencies in those other cells, then you have issues with that. Okay, so this is a lower part of the slide that someone really wanted to see. So innate immune response is what we see and then compensatory response will be what happens. Natalinda Isaac, there's something you're doing to my screen. Kindly undo that. Okay. So you have, so in Netflix, it's really what your body is trying to do to fight off infection. And then compensatory response will be as a result, as the organs try to respond to the infection. And it's usually as a result of decreased perfusion and therefore decreased oxygen supply. That's when we'll see the organ, um, the, the deficiencies or the deficits in those organs. You have the pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory 
proteins that come in, if you have a, you have an imbalance in those that will give you a dysregulated response, okay? So the organ dysfunction that we're going to see is going to be, because it's sepsis, it is literally every organ that's impacted, either because of decreased perfusion and therefore decreased um, oxygen supply and decreased supply of, 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 the, of the nutrients, or it's going to be because of, or it's going to be because of, of the effect of the cytokines. The cytokines are really those enzymes, the pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory enzymes that the body is producing to try and help it fight off this infection. So with every organ that you're going to see or every system, you're going to, it's going to have an impact. So with a CVS, usually you have a decrease in the main arterial pressure that's the decrease in your blood pressure, which is the driving pressure for organ perfusion. And then, which is usually as a result of the chemicals produced that cause the vasodilatation and cause shock. The other thing that also happens to the cardiovascular system is some of these proteins are cardiodepressant. So they depress the ventricles and decrease their contractility. So in addition to decreasing the mean arterial pressure, by decreasing the, 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 the tone in the vessels, you also have a myocardial depression from these particular proteins that will decrease your cardiac output and further decrease your mean arterial pressure. With organs like the liver, the increase you're going to have in bilirubin is really because of decreased supply to the hepatocytes. Or if you have, sorry, decreased perfusion, blood supply to the hepatocytes. So thus the effect that you'll see with a bilirubin is because the liver itself is not functioning as well as it should. A kidney, depending on whether it's innately, whether it's innately the kidney that's impacted or decreased supply, you're going to have decreased urine output, which will be shown by um, your increased creatinine. It could be because of of a perineal cause that's hypoperfusion, or you actually have the cytokines going and destroying your nephrons or going and, and, and causing dysregulation. Within your nervous system, it's usually either the primary disease process or decreased perfusion that causes altered mentation. And then respiratory wise, what's going to happen is, is We'll see in the next slide that you have, a, you have the leakage of capillary leakage. So when you have that leakage, you have, and you have fluid filling in the lungs and that can decrease perfusion. Sorry, that, sorry, that can decrease oxygenation. Therefore it causes dysfunction. So you'll, by now you probably have noticed that it's really an interplay of of, of events that causes the picture that we see in sepsis. And that's why we'll call it generalized. So literally every organ is going to be affected, whether it's the primary source of infection or not. And then the, the dysfunction from another organ usually impacts that the function of another organ. With a coagulation um, system or the cascade, depending, you have a disseminated intravascular coagulopathy. And so depending on what is happening, you're either going to have endothelial damage and then you have an increased, um, ad increased ad adhesion of platelets, you form clots, which give you microthrombi. And then that will further consume whatever coagulation factors you have. That's why you have increased risk of bleeding. So this is what you really have when it's just sepsis. This is what's going on. And depending on the other factors, that you get, um, these factors that will determine how much, in, how much dysfunction you're going to have at this level. So when you have significant dysfunction and you say you have decreased perfusion, you have signs of organ dysfunction, and you're still remaining hypotensive, or your MAP is less than 65 and your, your lactate is greater than two millimoles, 
after giving adequate fluid, then that's when we shall say you now have septic shock to try and increase that MAP or to try and improve that lactate, okay? Do you have any questions up to this point? Do you have any questions or issues at, up to this point? If I get no feedback, I'll continue. Yes, doctor. I just want to know how, how the shock affects the respiratory system. What do you mean how the shock? The respiratory system could impact what? Sh so the shock is really after these ones have happened. The shock is after this level has occurred then you end up with shock. Shock is now looking at the circulatory system failing. Do you know that definition of shock? Or what do you understand by shock? You've gone mute, so I do not know where you... Yes, doctor. Uh, shock is uh, when there's, I think, poor perfusion of organs. Is uh, okay. can be circulatory or neurogenic. Mm -hmm. Yes, but it's just perf poor perfusion. Of, of the organs. Okay. Alan, you have your hand raised. Yeah, me, doctor, was inquiring about uh, like how does the increased bilirubin come about? Okay, I think you missed that when I said it. I said that you're going to have significant effect as a result of this is all organ dysfunction, and usually it's because of decreased perfusion, okay? Which is highlighted here, okay? So let me just go back. So when, 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 when an infection happens, your body tries to fight it by producing all these macrophages and white cells and all those things, that's going to happen. But then there are also what we call cytokines, which are really proteins that help the body to try and fight off this infection. Some of them are anti-inflammatory, others are pro-inflammatory, which is really your immune response, trying to fight off this pathogen that has come. The effect of some of these is that they are going to cause vasodilatation, they are going to cause which will give you a decreased mean arterial pressure. They are going to cause um, increased aggregation of cells, sorry, adhesion of platelets, particularly, that's going to cause clots within vessels. So all these cause decreased blood supply to the different organs, okay? So because you have decreased perfusion, this is where we are you have decreased perfusion, you have decreased blood supply, you have decreased oxygen reaching these organs, then you see the effect, the effect of your decreased perfusion and decreased oxygen supply in these different organs. Are we clear up to that point? Are we clear up to that point? Whoever asked? Alan, are we clear up to that point? Yes, Doc. So that decreased power to impact all the different organs. And what we see here in green is really what we'll see as a symptom or sorry, as a sign that this organ is, in, is affected by sepsis. So with the liver, you'll probably see an increased bilirubin, but maybe you'll also see an increased enzyme in increased levels in the enzymes. All this is because of decreased perfusion to the hepatocytes. So if the hepatocytes are not getting enough blood or enough oxygen, what's going to happen is 
the bilio, the the work that they do, which is usually build, breakdown of the bilirubi is going to be impacted. So you're going to have increased levels of bilirubin. And then you also have eventually increased levels of your enzymes. Is that clear? Yes, doctor. Oh. Do we have any other questions up to this point? Whatever you see at this level is just showing you what, sign, what we'll see as organ dysfunction. What you'll say that, oh, this patient is, and we're having the CNS affected. It's not that all the patients will have all of these. Some of them will come in and they just have altered mentation. Or some of them are going to come in and creatinine and urea are increased. That will show you that, okay, we have sepsis, but we have sepsis and our kidneys are now involved. We have sepsis and now our CNS is involved. That's what this green area is just showing you. We have sepsis and our respiratory system is involved. This is, is really just showing, it's, it's a ratio that's used for, or for, for showing how much perfusion you're having. Yes, Luca, you raised your hand up and mute and ask. Uh, yes, doctor. I want to understand how altered level of consciousness is a compensatory mechanism in this case. So compensation doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to compensate and 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 and, and be normal. The compensation is trying to show you something is wrong. Okay. In the CNS trying to okay. so when let's let's use the CVS because that's the one compensatory mechanism that's most easily understood. So in the CVS, when you when the when the blood pressure is when the blood blood when perfusion of organs is low, say to the brain, what's going to happen? What does the CVS do to try and in, in improve perfusion? Uh, we increase the heart rate. Okay, so you're going to have a tachycardia. Yes. To try and increase supply, okay? Yes. The respiratory system is going to try, you're going to try and breathe faster. The CNS, what's going to happen is because it's not getting as much perfusion as it's supposed to, it's going to try and shut down a little. That's why you're going to have a decreased level of consciousness. So that it decreases okay. how much Thank work you. it is supposed to do. Any other questions up to this point? Do you have any questions? Okay, since I have no, no response, we'll consider this. Um, so, that, so whatever you see in the other organs, that's just going to show you that there is organ dysfunction. But when you come to saying that this patient is in shock, you're looking at perfusion per se only. You're, you're looking at, at the circulatory system and you're saying that, this patient has remained hypotensive or this patient is having decreased perfusion and yet I have given adequate fluid. That's when you will say that now we are at septic shock, okay? So looking at this is really, you don't usually need to, to, to this is just trying to break down what's happening at a cellular level, okay? So you have the cells coming in for your <clears throat> immune response. They produce the bradykinins like histamine. They cause vasodilatation. So you have decreased supply. So you have the decreased, sorry, decreased perfusion and decreased oxygen supply, as we saw in the previous slide. Then you see the effects that we see, okay? You have endothelial damage so that you have leakage. And so you have the, the, the whatever, intravascular fluid is going in, can easily leak into the extravascular space, usually the interstitial space. And so you, so that's the leakage you have, okay? That's really, this is just trying to explain to you what's happening at cellular level. And then you also have that endothelial damage is going to increase formation of um, clots because you have tissue factor being, being exposed. 
And all that will decrease your blood supply and you decrease blood pressure and you end up with shock that we, we see. The other thing um, this is just trying to highlight is that the vasodilatation that we see or this endothelial damage happens from the arterial end all through to the venial end of whatever it is that you're supplying. Okay, that's the importance of this slide. So one might ask, okay, how do I know my patient is having sepsis? Okay. Um, I'll just pick on someone. Miro, Emmanuel, what did you come across? If you're wondering how your patient, with all this that's happening, you're looking at cellular level, but when you when you're the specialist or when you're the intern or the fifth year soon, how will you know that this patient might actually be having sepsis? What did you come across? Okay, okay. Uh, uh, doctor, thank you for the question. So the, uh, first of all, we need to have a high index of suspicion. So my patient has maybe a potential source of infection or an actual non-source of infection. I'll have a high index of suspicion then there are clinical scores you can use, like the Chusofa. Mm -hmm. I think it has three parameters. Okay. So you have the respiratory rate. I think it was above 22. Mm -hmm. Then we have uh, the level of consciousness, which has to be altered. Okay. Uh, the third parameter was blood pressure. Okay. Yeah, so I think it was below 100 for systolic. Okay. I don't remember. Yes, yeah. so If they have a positive two so far and you have a potential source of infection, then you know you have sepsis. Perfect. Um, yeah. Anyone has an objection or anything to supplement? Okay. Very well said. Um, so. The initial score um, was a SOFA score. The initial score was a SOFA score, which really would make it very hard because these are not parameters that you can easily have on the emergency ward or in a certain setting, okay? So in, so in most settings, you wouldn't be able to, to have all these done. So it would delay that. That's why we have what he mentioned as the Q so far score. So this is, is really as basic as basic that um, we should be able to recall. Um, and, and it just, as long as you have any, a patient having at least one of these, or at least two of these, sorry, at least two of these, then you would consider them to be septic, okay? And then the mortality, if you have more than one is about 10%. So it also helps you to look at the, the risk of mortality in this patient and therefore help you to prognosticate. So this is as simple as simple. It, it, it should be easy for you to remember it off head. So this is an easier score that can be done even on the emergency ward to know which patient has sepsis so that you can manage them appropriately. Okay. So, so that's really how you diagnose sepsis. Septic shock still remains the same definition. After you've, after you've done adequate resuscitation, then you, you will know how much to, what to give. Okay. So... Someone called Namobi Pauline Patricia. What did you come across regarding resuscitation of septic patients? Josephine? Thank you. Um, I think for the resuscitation of Septic patients, since they're mainly bacterial causes, you really want yeah, to not give... mainly bacterial causes. Intravenous or systemic antibiotics is one of the drugs you want to use. 
okay, but not always. They're not always bacterial causes. Thank you for the correction. Okay, what else do you want to do? Sham someone called Shamila. What else is done for management of this patient? Shakira. Increase the map. Yes, buddy. <clears throat> Yes, thank you, Doctor. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I want to disagree with Kakosa. After ABCs, you don't go to antibiotics. Before again, you go to IV fluids. Yes, I agree. It is an emergency. So we do ABC, check whether the air is patent, if it's breathing. Then when you go to saturation, obviously it's in shock. So the BPs will be very low. That means we put two IV light bore cannulas. Uh, that is like green or gray. Then we, that resuscitation fluid or 30 mils in like one hour as we take off uh, blood samples for, for like maybe blood grouping and uh, cross matching, then uh, investigations uh, such as maybe <clears throat> get what germ or bacteria or something is causing the sepsis, then yeah, we keep on monitoring the vitals, that is the BP, the temperature, the respiratory rate, the SpO2, so that we reassess after the rapid fluid resuscitation and we start on maintenance fluids. Uh, others, uh, if the 30 mils package is not working, then we they also give, they, they, I remember us giving some units of blood and then we have maintaining, then we give empirical empirical treatment of antibiotics, usually self on two grams. Thank you. Okay. So just take us to this slide. So the most recent guideline is actually an hour one bundles. So all those bundles, the genesis was, they realized over time that the shorter, the faster that they, they did, they, they, they tried to, to treat the sepsis, then the, the faster it is that they sort of cut or stopped that cycle of events. Um, so there was hour six, it dropped down to hour three by the time you were in third year, Three. Um, but then our three still we were still losing time. And so it was brought to one hour, whereby time zero is a time of recognition. 
of that sepsis, sorry, of sepsis or septic shock, okay? So the ABCs really would, they can come in, but when you're looking at sepsis there, there's five things of the things that you really, really want to do matters you're helping all the other organs. As long as it is sepsis, if things that team to be able to handle these and it, and so you need to be able to interpret. Interpret it appropriately. So it's really five things that you look at. You look at the lactate level, um, from which and as you, which you try to relate to. Uh, I think it shows uh, build up of toxins in the body. Is it toxins? Pardon? Is it really toxins? I'm not sure. You're not sure. Richard, kindly unmute yourself. Richard? Unmute yourself and then you explain your yeah. response of an aerobic respiration. Okay, the, the high the high the high values of lactate will show the that an aerobic respiration is taking place at several levels because we are not having sufficient oxygen to cut out the aerobic respiration. So after our glycolysis, we shall have pyruvate undergoing anaerobic respiration in order for us to see that we can generate back our Okay. To keep on Okay, so <clears throat> that's really the importance because we've seen what sepsis does at a cellular level. If it's greater than two, then you're thinking there's something going on regarding perfusion. So at that time, you're going to measure lactate. Lactate will also help you with for resuscitation and see whether you have a response to your fluids. Then obtaining antibiotic, sorry, obtaining blood cultures or blood samples for blood culture before administering antibiotics is important so that you know, since it's systemic, at that point, you believe it is really a generalized infection that's, that should be also in your bloodstream. Okay. Then, so they, they go to antibiotics, but depending on, at, on which level at which you find this patient and what you think could be causing the sepsis, then you're going to have sort of, you're going to administer things differently. So there are places, there are patients in whom you'll suspect this patient is septic, but we think it is caused by fungus and so it's caused by fungus and so you will give them um, an antifungal at the start. You don't wait for blood, for blood culture results before you administer the antibiotics. That's why we say broad spectrum. So it's about, okay, I see this could be the source of infection. So we are going to go for this antibiotic or this antifungal agent because we think these are the possible organisms we are dealing with. Then when you get the blood culture results, then you'll be able to what to do what we call de-escalation appropriately or give that give a narrow spectrum agent or antimicrobial, give a narrow spectrum antimicrobial agent for those particular organisms. So at that time they come in, they'll say antibiotics, but as we've already discussed, sepsis is beyond bacteria, just that it's thought to be only bacteria that happens. 
Okay. And remember that the blood culture samples should be taken before you give it because if you give it after, if you take it after, you're not going to end up with um, accurate results. Okay. Then you also, so you, um, if they're hypotensive or when you have a lactate of greater than four millimoles, it means they are having significant hypoperfusion. So you'll give the, you'll give, you'll give um, fluid resuscitate, you'll resuscitate with fluid. That's um, 30 milligrams, sorry, 30 mils per kilogram body weight of a crystalloid to try and improve perfusion. So there you're monitoring things like your lactate if you're able to, your blood pressures, your end organ perfusion, things like your CNS, you're looking at level of um, their level of mentation. You're looking at <clears throat> peripheries, things like warmth, capillary field time, all those things that show that show that you have adequate end organ perfusion are the things you're going to monitor and see whether you're still um if whether you're still adequately perfusing okay so if you need if if this if you've given adequate fluid but the patient is still hypotensive or their map is less than 65 then you're going to give them a vas you're going to have a vasopressor on board or you're still having a lactate of greater than two from the other definition, that's when you're going to now say that I need to give this patient a vasopressor, have a vasopressor on board to help them with perfusion. Okay. Do we have any questions up to that point? Do we have any questions? So as you can see, this is supposed to be, this was written that it should be done in the one hour. That's really trying to, 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 to fight off um, the infection and sort of just stop that cascade wherever it has reached, stop the cycle where it has reached so that you're not having um, that um, downward spiral happening. Ideally, it's supposed to be done. Ideally, it's supposed to be done in the one hour, okay? It has these controversies of how possible it is that it can be done in one hour. Those are all debates that are happening on whether it can actually happen in one hour. Yes, Kakoza, your hand is raised. Yes, doctor, according to our here at the referral, I don't know whether okay. we do the lactate level as an emergency, so what do no, we- No, I mentioned that... we don't have lactate. So here at the referral, do we start Why from not? step three? Uh, I mean, from step two. Oh, okay, maybe, do we use other so parameters you, like- So you, so this is this is what they wrote, but you remember what we, we used QSOFA to make the diagnosis. Okay. We used QSOFA to make the mm. diagnosis. But right. then because we don't have lactate, that doesn't mean we cannot tell that the patient is not responding. Lactate is supposed to show us perfusion, but there are other things or other parameters that we can try and use to see whether we are having adequate perfusion or end organ perfusion. Is that clear? Which you can use it MRH. So you get your patient, maybe they are obtained it by the time you get them or just it is altered, or if you have cold peripheries or capillary refill time, or they are BPs, they are hypotensive, all those are things that you can actually use to try okay. and help. Yes, Paddy, your hand is raised. Yes, doctor, my question is about uh, the crystalloids. Mm -hmm. As here on what they emphasize, we give ringers lactate over normal mm -hmm. saline as a crystal of choice. I'm wondering why, mm -hmm. and yet ringers mm -hmm. lactate also contains lactate, and our problem won't reduce lactate. So why is it ideal? 
Or as it ideal, it's okay, it's a debate also. However, if you look at what are the contents to what are the contents of no more cell line and what yeah. does fingers lactate have? Uh, no more cell line, I know it contains sodium and chloride only, including pH. Mm -hmm. Yes, pH. Ringers lactate, I have forgotten. Like yeah. What's the pH of, of cell line and how different is compared to the pH of, of ringers lactate? I think the pH of saline is, is close to that of the body. Seven, six point nine, seven point one around there. Then ringers lactate, I don't know. Six point one is actually low. So that if you look at the pH of the body, it's really tight. Six point nine is low for the body. By the time you even have a pH of seven point one, you're literally acidotic. So if you look at the body, it really tries to maintain its pH tightly, okay? So there's a debate on whether cell line has a lower pH compared to Ringer's lactate. And also the, 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 the worry that, that you're going to have, it's, 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 it's sort of a gray area, but the worry that always oh, is that am I going to cause more acidosis? The worry, sorry, is the fear that they're going to cause more acidosis when given saline as opposed to when you use Ringer's lactate. Then if you look at a balance or what we call a balanced crystalloid, if you look at what's there, the, the commonest we have in our setting is Ringer's lactate, okay? or the cheapest that's available is Ringer's lactate. That's why they end up using Ringer's lactate in those patients. There's, a, of course, a worry that all oh, is lactate in the Ringer's, so it's really one of those. The gray area, I could say. No clear, clear, no clear cut um, answer. Risk of causing hyperkalemia, not so much. Um, someone saying normal cell line easily extravasating all of them, whether ringers or cell line, will easily extravasate. So the so what really they recommend is a balanced crystalloid, which in our setting is going to be ringers lactate. But you can still give them cell line if that's if that's what there. You want to give them a crystalloid, but remember that their capillaries are leaky meaning whatever crystalloid is given can easily get out, um, is, can easily get out of their system. The other crystal, so what they were, what they commonly um, talk about is colloids, or you'll find a debate of colloids versus crystalloids. The only colloid that is, 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 is studied and showed a bit of a benefit is albumin, which is too expensive, and there was no significant survival benefit. So we go back to a balanced crystalloid, of which our most balanced one is 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 what is is Ringer's lactate. So both of them will still extravasate it as long as the patient is leaky. It's only a colloid which won't. Um, Emmanuel, you had your hand raised up. Uh, yes, doctor. So I, 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 I thought I was going beyond the first one hour because the, the patient, we are giving them a supplemental oxygen. So I was thinking, what is the threshold for mechanical ventilation in patients who have septic shock? What's the, I would first throw one question back to you. What's the indication for mechanical ventilation? Okay, if we are giving a non-invasive ventilation and we still have hypoxemia. Hypoxemia, so mechanical ventilation is really for support, for respiratory support. So if, if hypoxemia is not being corrected by whatever other modalities and the 
the lungs actually need help from the machine. That's when you're going to give them. That's when you're going to administer um, mechanical ventilation. Does that okay, answer your question? Yes, I've understood it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So Joseph, you write no ability for SV. What does SV mean? So this, whatever is here is ideally supposed to be done in one hour. The questions you're asking are justified because that's, those are the, that's the same debate that is happening, that this can't happen in one hour. Yes, Daniel, your hand is raised. Yes, yes, doctor. Good morning. Um, Good morning. Yes, so we talked about um, the mouth, the, the, the organ failure and my attention went to the lung. So we said mm -hmm. um, there will be pulmonary edema, right? Yeah. Now, um, when, now, when you start giving these fluids aggressively, um, mm -hmm. are we worried about um, worsening this condition of pulmonary edema? Yes, you definitely have to be worried because everything is leaky. They will leak everywhere, including the lungs. So, so you don't give the 30 mils, you don't wait and say, I'm first going to give all the 30 mils per kg, then I determine. You look at what response you're having, okay? The 30 mils per kg is really what we're defining as adequate resuscitation to say that this patient has gotten adequate fluid, okay? But remembering that this patient is going to leak crystal. So that's hence the debate of, do we still need to give crystalloid? Sometimes people are going to ask for a colloid at a certain point because the patient is just too leaky or they are leaking too much. Whatever you're giving IV goes to the interstitial space. And so people ask for things like blood, which is the only colloid we, we can easily access here. Or they'll ask for things like fresh frozen plasma because it is a colloid. It's going to stay within the intravascular space and actually heal. You are saying? Yes, and oh, yes, thank you for, for clarification on that. And then um, in the event that um, the pulmonary edema happens, what, how do you reverse it? Or do you stop the fluids? What, what happens if it, if it worsens after giving fluids? So depending on the level, of the, 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 the severity of their pulmonary edema, okay? So you're going to treat it as pulmonary edema and try to treat the pulmonary edema, okay? We're not going to go into the details of that because it's really out of what this yes, is. Yes, yes. But yes. so you're going to treat the pulmonary edema depending on the severity and try to prevent worsening. So you look at how much fluid you're giving, whether they're going to be able to tolerate it. And sometimes you don't, it's, it's not that you're going to wait for 30 mils per kg before you, you have any intervention, you will be able to see whether you're having a response to your resuscitation, even before you reach your 30 mils per kg. You'll be able to see. So maybe you're giving, you've given, and you've reached about 20 mils per kg. Sometimes even the blood pressure is worse. You are not going to continue with only that, saying that um, I have to reach 30 mils per kg before I say this patient needs um, needs, needs, needs what? Needs, needs any other intervention. You're giving as you monitor the response. So you, sometimes you'll have the pressures coming in on board much earlier. Okay? Okay, okay, thank you. Yes. Two people had their hands raised. Three, just unmute. Elvis. Um, good morning, doctor. Good morning. Uh, thank you so much for the lecture. My question still remains uh, in regards to what Daniel had said. Uh, mm -hmm. When we give the patient the fluid and we are watching mm -hmm. out, at what point do you, you said, because we've seen that you give fluids and if there's less fluid response, we are switching to vasopressors. Okay, we, we are thinking about vasopressors, if I'm right. So mm -hmm. at what point do you opt not to add more fluid and give the patient blood in preference to, to fluid? In reference to fluid. 
in preference. So it's really, um, <laughs> some of this is going to be tricky for you to understand, but you, write, you look at a patient and the organ dysfunction that you're having. For all these patients, definitely what you give, they're going to leak, okay? And depending on, on, I don't want to say how much you have seen, but you will be able to, so you first run the crystalloid that you have and see whether you have a response. It doesn't mean that you start with blood from the start, unless of course they are anemic. But if you have a patient who already comes in, they are, They've, they've gotten some bit of fluid. I don't want to give you a fixed number, but they're already having significant damage or they're already leaking. And you're giving, you say you've given up to say a liter or 1.5 liters of fluid, or you've given up to 20 mils per kg of fluid. This is, this is just, this is not a fixed number. And you're not having a response, but you can clearly see extravasating all this fluid because you're not even having it being produced in the kidneys, you're not having any response in terms of, of, of perfusion, like a capillary refill time, then you'll know that my patient is actually not, whatever I'm giving is extravasating. Some of them, you're going to see them get puffy. At that point, you will know that if I am giving this patient any crystalloid, I am not helping them for some of them. For others, it, you give the 30 mils per kg, they seem to improve. And then after that, there's nothing. So that's, that's really what, what you're going to do. There's no exact point. It's not a one size fits. So that's what I would tell you. It's really for, it's, it's a case by case. It's, it's, a, it's, it's sort of a case by case decision that you make or whether bring in blood or whether to bring in colloid but like i said earlier there's no big they've shown that if there's no big difference in in mortality or survival whether you use a colloid or a crystalloid so give the crystalloid that you have as opposed to waiting to give a colloid because you're thinking oh this is sepsis and and we need the colloid give the crystalloid to try and improve perfusion if you don't have a response to your crystalloid, then try and give something else or add a vasopressor. Okay. Is that any clearer? <clears throat> Is that any clearer? I don't remember who asked the question. Yes, who asked the question? It's, very, it's, it's me, Elvis, who asked the question. Okay. Is it clear? Yeah, maybe lastly, um, we've been mm -hmm. talking about lactate and monitoring uh, monitoring lactate levels, but uh, frankly, I've, I haven't seen anyone monitor lactate levels in our setting. So my yeah, my query is that mm -hmm. yes, my query is that uh, we are trying to ana analyze uh, the rate at which muscle is being broke, broken down and the rate of uh, organ failure. <laughs> at a cellular level, but in what, where does oliguria come to help us in a role in relation to organ failure? And at what level do we, do we use it in our monitoring, in monitoring of our patients to assess the failure? So you remember what I asked about what lactate we are thinking, where this lactate is coming from at the beginning of the lecture or yes, midway? I so it's not yes. really muscle breakdown per se. It's, it's, it's lactate is going to happen as long as a cell, sorry, lactate production is going to happen as long as a cell is not, is not producing, sorry, is not getting enough oxygen to break down and, pump, and take everything to the Krebs cycle and everything and the end of, of that cycle. So as long as it's not getting enough of that, everything goes into lactate which is what they, that's how they ended up starting to measure lactate um, for sepsis because the, the biggest issue was perfusion of those cells. So they tried to use it as that, but then there are other models.
modalities that people, after asking questions like, okay, does lactate necessarily mean only these cells or something else can be used to actually show whether oxygen is being used? So those are other, other modalities that are, are really quite advanced for what you should be knowing. We don't use lactate here because it's, it's really needed of an arterial line, which you don't have um, always, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't know about lactate. We have them. Okay. Okay, Walter. Thank you so much, doctor. My question is about uh, the recognition of sepsis. Uh, I'm inquiring about the SARS criteria. We mm -hmm. had the SARS criteria at some point, which was looking at fever, then tachypnea, tachycardia, and leukocytosis. I don't know whether currently it's still being used or it phased out. We don't use SARS anymore. SARS was, was when they were trying to understand what sepsis is and trying to break it down when we had the division of, when they were sort of dividing it into SARS, sepsis, all these other things. Um, so that, that's really when they were trying to understand what sepsis is. So what they did and, and, and try to, to just summer, to, to put everything together was, all these other, they know that it's an inflammatory infection that's going to occur, but then they realize that um, at whatever level of sepsis, whether it's severe or not severe, you're going to have an inflammatory response. So they just took it to that and stayed as long as you have this that's happening, as long as it's, it's you have. Um, So as long as I'm trying to, sorry for that interruption, um, to just have sepsis and septic shock. They were just conventional no things that were done. We need to end this lecture. Mohomoza, one last question and we end. Uh, good morning, doctor. Good morning. Uh, okay, I was, I was, I was inquiring if uh, uh, the use of uh, anti-inflammatory medication could be of importance in this case, the fact that uh, sepsis is characterized by an overwhelming inflammatory response. Thank you. Mm. Kali, very good thinking. You preempted my last slide. So these are things that have been tried to be, they've tried to use and see whether we actually have an inflammatory, whether we can give in, inflammatory agents and these are really things that are still being tried and but because you have significant damage with sepsis we're still we're still happy of mortality and also the cost of of these so as our understanding of sepsis gets better we might try have more of these, like what you saw with first um, the remdesivir and all those other immunoglobulins that have been given, these are all trying to modify the immune response. So that's, that's really studies trying to improve, or trying to manage sepsis. Do we have any other questions? The rest you can just, you'll, you'll, you'll find me somewhere in Peta if you have them, or you'll send an email and then I'll answer them. The person who asked about steroids, I'm told you have a lecture, so we'll leave steroids for now. It's still a debate also, but since you have a lecture now, we can't ex I can't um, explain that. Okay, any other questions? I'm told you have a lecture, so I need to just end this. Thank you so much, Doctor, for sparing your time and teaching us. All right.
All right, have a good day. Enjoy.